Hello great tans and welcome back to another video with me Miss Martins. In today's video we're going to be looking at sound waves which are a type of a longitudinal wave. Remember if you've missed any wave examples or any wave videos that I've done I will link my playlist in the description box below. Remember to stay tuned because I give teacher tips throughout my videos that will help you level up your marks. Let's jump right in. First things first you need to know that sound waves are longitudinal waves. And longitudinal waves are waves in which the particles of the medium vibrate parallel to the direction of the motion of the medium. Sound waves are pressure waves, longitudinal waves, and you should know that longitudinal waves are also what we call mechanical waves, which means that they need a medium to travel through. So sound waves need a medium to travel through. They must be able to travel through air or water or some sort of medium. So first things first, just as I mentioned, sound waves are longitudinal waves and it results from the vibration of an object. So when I speak, I vibrate the air particles and that results in a pressure wave that transmits energy, a longitudinal wave that transmits energy. And remember, we need a medium because we need to disturb the particles of the medium. So something needs to vibrate, something needs to transfer the energy, and that's the air particles or the water particles. So that's why I said over here, pressure waves, sound waves are pressure waves, they transmit energy, and we need it to be a mechanical wave, it's a mechanical wave because we need a medium, the particles of the medium need to vibrate. And this is what I showed you in the last video. So the vibrations are propagated, which means they move through the medium as a series of compressions and rarefactions, which means you can't see it. But when I speak, there's a whole range or a whole, you know, series of compressions, rarefactions, compressions, rarefactions. It's causing the air particles to vibrate. It's making your way to its ear where it causes your eardrum to vibrate. And that's how we hear. So sound waves are longitudinal waves. It's a very, very important thing. Now, sound waves require a medium to travel through. Like I told you, they are mechanical waves. They are longitudinal waves, which are mechanical waves, which means they need a medium to travel through. Here's some examples of mediums. Gas, which is obviously the air around us, you should know that the air around us is made up of a variety of gases like oxygen gas and nitrogen gas and carbon dioxide gas. We know that sound can also travel through liquid like a water and sound can also travel through a solid. Now, out of these three mediums, remember these are mediums, they have particles. All three of these things have particles, that's why the sound can travel through them which through which medium gas liquid or solid do you think sound travels the best through you have to think carefully about this do you think sound travels the best through air do you think it travels the best through liquid like water or a solid now the answer may surprise you but sound waves travel well through a gas so air they travel well through air but better through a liquid so water and the Based through a solid and you might be like but ma'am when my friend speaks to me underwater I can't hear what they're saying I'm not talking about clarity of the sound I'm tra I'm talking about how well does the sound travel how fast does it travel how how well does it travel through that that medium now why do you think sound waves would travel the best through a solid what makes a solid a liquid and a gas different think about it you may not have learned it in chemistry yet but what makes these different is how the particles are packed. Now, solids generally have their particles packed a lot more densely. So the particles are a lot closer together in a solid. In a liquid, the particles are further apart. It's less dense. In a gas, the particles are very far apart. So it's not as dense. Now, think about it. Sound waves travel best through a solid. And I'm telling you, it's got to do with the particles, the density of the particles. When the particles are more dense, they are closer together. And think about it like this. The particles are closer together. This one vibrates. This one vibrates. It allows the energy to, tra to be transferred a lot quicker, a lot easier. So sound waves travel much faster through a denser medium such as water. So if we're comparing air versus water, sound waves will travel faster in water because water is denser than air. If you're comparing water and a solid, sound will travel better through a solid because it's a denser medium. So, 
sound waves travel better through denser mediums. Okay, and water is denser than air. And just so you know, the speed of sound in air at approximately 20 degrees Celsius is approximately 340 meters per second. That's very fast. So remember, speed is represented by V. And I'm telling you the speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second. That's quite quick. It's not as quick as the, um, the speed of light, which you'll learn about in a later video, in a later topic. But the speed of sound in air, remember, it's dependent on the temperature. So if it's a hotter temperature, the speed might be different or will be different. Okay, but at about that temperature, that's the speed. Now, it's very, very, very important that you understand the relationships between these variables over here. Now, if I tell you that I'm speaking about the speed of sound through air, and I told you the speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second, what I need you to understand is, okay, let's say I have a situation where speed is 340 meters per second, and I tell you, okay, cool, I tell you that the frequency of the wave is 20 hertz. Let's just pretend. How would you work out the wavelength? Well, 20 multiplied by something will give me 340. So 340 divided by 20 will give me the wavelength. This wavelength has to be 17. Now just stay with me. Remember the speed of sound in air is 340. So it's going to stay 340. But what happens if I half the frequency. So what's half of 20? Half of 20 is 10. If I half the frequency, what must now happen to the wavelength? Think about it like this. What multiplied by 10 gives me 340? This would be 34 now. Now take note of what I've done. V is constant. So V is the same. I haven't changed V. I haven't changed the speed. I have, what did I do to frequency? I halved frequency. So I divided frequency by 2. So frequency went from 20 hertz to 10 hertz. So I kept speed the same. I halved frequency. What happened to the wavelength? How do you get from 17 to 34? You times it by 2. So what do you notice here, grade 10s? If I halve the frequency... So if I divide the frequency by 2, if I halve the frequency, I double the wavelength if my speed is constant. This is called an inversely proportional relationship. So what I'm trying to tell you is if I double frequency, I must halve wavelength. If I halve frequency, I must double wavelength. See if you can get this one. What happens if I had to multiply frequency by 3? Remember, the speed is going to stay constant, so the speed's not going to stay the same. So if the speed stays the same, and I double, or triple, sorry, frequency, what must happen to the wavelength? I must divide it by 3. If I had to times the frequency by 5, I have to divide the wavelength by 5. So what this means is that frequency and wavelength are inversely proportional. It's very good to know these relationships. It might not come in handy necessarily now, right now, but they could ask it in past papers. They can ask it um, in your upcoming exams. You need to know it for grade 11 and grade 12. So I want you to know that if velocity, if the speed V, the speed of the wave stays the same, frequency and wavelength do the opposite. So if I make frequency bigger, wavelength is going to go smaller. If I make wavelength bigger, frequency is going to go smaller. They do the opposite things. They are inversely proportional. If I double frequency, wavelength will half. If I triple frequency, wavelength will be a third. Okay, so it's called an inversely proportional relationship, and I wrote it over here for you. Frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength, and we write it like this. That symbol, so frequency, is inversely proportional to wavelength. If you see that funny symbol and you see 1 over something, so 1 divided by something, then you know that it means frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength. 
So I'm going to write inversely proportional to wavelength. That's what that means. If you see the funny symbol and one divided by, it means that frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength. But this relationship is only true if V is constant. Now, if I've lost you, I don't want you to stress too much about this. This stuff becomes a little bit more important in grade 11 and in grade 12. But what I do want you to know are these last two sentences. So if I have you stressing out about these funny symbols and these relationships, don't want you to worry, but these last two are important, these two um, sentences. So just know that if wavelength is big, frequency is small. Okay, so a large or a long wavelength means a low or a small frequency. And in the same way, if wavelength is small, what does that mean about frequency? It means that frequency is big or high. So a short or a small wavelength will have a high or a big frequency. Those two sentences I do want you to know. On the next video, what I'll be doing is I'll be going over some examples. I'll be doing some important questions. Some of these are on an exam level, so you don't want to miss that video. I will see you then.